Prey Day is a survival game that actually has multiplayer. It seems like they got their inspiration from Last Day on Earth, but it also seems like they got a lot of their inspiration directly from Rust, which is believed to be where Last Day on Earth got their inspiration. The developers of the game have declared that it is an alpha, but the game has started with more content than any of the other mobile-based survival games when they started and they claim to be in beta. The first thing you need to do when playing any of these games is decide whether or not you want to design your home area with trees. Because once you chop down these trees, you cannot get them back. Build whatever workbenches you can, but don't worry about building walls just yet because other players raiding your base does not exist in the game yet. Make sure to build a knife, axe, hammer, and crowbar. Then leave the area and go to the world map. You will get notified that a zombie horde is coming your way within 24 hours. As long as you do not enter your base when the zombie horde arrives, nothing will happen to your base. The world map consists of seven different types of zones. The first type is your home, which is where you bring all of your stuff so that you can advance in the game. The second type is a friendly zone called Adelaide. This is a great place to meet other real players and currently has the only NPC shop in the game. I'm going to go into more details about each of these zones a little later on. The third type of zone are single player zones with green, yellow, and red difficulty levels. Which when you are starting out the game, you want to spend most of your time in these zones. The fourth type are PvP zones, which can be a lot of fun and a great way to get easy loot, but I would avoid them at first. The fifth type of zone is an event. Every 24 hours, an event will appear with a green, yellow, or red difficulty. These events have amazing loot for how little enemies are guarding them, but be careful not to leave the area until you're done looting because as soon as you leave the area, even if you haven't done anything, it will completely lock you out of the event. The sixth type of zone is a boss zone. The boss also drops awesome loot and this zone will also lock you out for 24 hours if you leave the area, even if you did not kill the boss. The seventh zone is a clan boss zone. This zone will not lock you out if you leave, but you have to have a clan to be able to enter the zone. And the boss has 5,000 hit points, so I don't think you should go without your friends. Now when you first leave your base, your first event will appear. Here. You have 45 minutes to do that event, so I would recommend first going to both of these single player green zones. Travel time is just a few seconds and it only takes 5 minutes to clear a zone, so you have plenty of time left over to go to the event. Each single player zone has its own unique setup, but they're set up the exact same way every time you enter them. So not only will the main loot chest always be in the same place, but every tree and rock will be in the exact same place. And while the zombies sometimes have a more complex walking pattern, they too will always be the same. So the more that you can complete a certain zone, the more you will be able to master that zone. I strongly recommend mastering these two green zones before even entering any of the other single player or PvP zones. I've now gotten to the point that I can get the main loot chest and everything else I want from one of these zones in less than two minutes and I only have to kill three or four enemies. But it took me several tries on each one before I would develop those strategies. This zone is the best for getting wood, stone, and seeds and this zone is better for getting metal. But they're both good for getting basic resources and the main loot chests give the same quality of items. When you're first starting off, always drop back by your base in between zones to drop off everything because if you die, you lose everything that's on you. But later on, after you've mastered the zones, it's a lot easier to visit two or three before returning to your base. After farming those two zones, gear up to go to your first event. You will need a knife, full health, preferably a little bit of armor, and about 15 berries. But don't bring anything else because you will need as much room as possible in your backpack. When you get to the event, try to sneak around to find all five or six main loot chests. These chests have the best loot that you're going to find until your next event or until you join a clan. All loot is good loot. When you're looting this event, choose everything over wood, stone, and metal because you can easily get those things in green zones. You will find things like crumpled up notes and rubber duckies and you might think that they're not worth anything. That is definitely not true. Items that are not used for crafting are generally worth 40 to 50 dog tags at the NPC in Adelaide. We'll talk more about those items when we talk about Adelaide. Remember that as soon as you leave the area you will get locked out of the event so make sure to get everything you can before you leave. 
And don't die either, because then you obviously get nothing. As you return home, you will notice that the two green zones are still on cooldown. From the moment you collect the first resource in a single player zone, that zone will go into a cooldown. Green zones have a 30 minute cooldown, yellow zones have a 45 minute cooldown, and red zones have a one hour cooldown. So while the green zones are still in cooldown, put everything away except your non-craftable items like notebooks and rubber ducks and head to Adelaide. When you get to Adelaide, you will see a lot of green players. Do not be fooled. They are not your friends. They are only green because you are at Adelaide. And while some of them may want to become your friends and eventually join a clan with you, others will try to lure zombies over to you and hope that when you're not paying attention, the zombies will kill you so they can get your stuff. There are no missions in the game yet, so there are currently only four reasons to come to Adelaide. The first one is to sell your items to get dog tags. The second one is to buy items with those dog tags. I personally recommend only buying gears, springs, guns, or items that you're wanting to research. Every four hours, a new lineup of items will appear. You can't unlock these extra slots yet because there are no missions and therefore no reputation. But if you buy a cheaper item, then a new one will take its place. When you're buying and selling items, it is important to note that the ratio of buying and selling is 7 to 1. This will also change when missions are introduced into the game, but right now, it's 7 to 1. So do not buy something that you might want to sell one day, and do not sell something that you might want to buy someday. Because it would be far cheaper to just build a few more chests and store it for later. The third thing that people do at Adelaide is trade items. If you go to the section in the back where there are zombies, you can trade items by looting a dead zombie or chest and putting items into it rather than taking them out. Your friend can then take all those items, but be careful because there are other players that lurk around knowing that they might be able to grab it instead of your friend. If you want to trade with a friend, I recommend going to this green PvP zone and only bringing the items that you want to give to your friend and then letting your friend kill you. This is the easiest and fastest way to transfer items. They can then go home and come back with what they want to give you and you can kill them. Now this doesn't work if you're part of a clan together but then you can just use your clan members to help guard you when you make the exchange. The fourth thing you can do at Adelaide is make friends. There are almost always people chatting in this area so once you finish your radio tower this would be a good place to find some teammates. After putting your dog tags away you should be able to go to the green zones again. I can't emphasize enough how important it is that you master these zones before you move on to other zones. Not only can these zones give you everything you need to build a radio tower, they will give you a framework for how all of the other zones work. For example, you will notice that the main loot chest is more heavily guarded than any other area of that zone. This is true for all of the zones. By working to be as efficient as possible in these zones, you will start to develop tricks that would have been hard to pull off in a more difficult zone if you had not first practiced them in an easy zone. Here are 16 tips and tricks that I first learned in the green zones. First, if you are just starting out and are trying to learn or master zone, I recommend popping in and out of the zone until you get the spawn point that you are used to. By farming the zone from the exact same angle each time, you will become familiar with that zone faster. Now if you are struggling to the point that you don't even have enough resources to make a weapon or basic tools, I recommend doing what I call the pop and grab. Simply enter the zone, grab what you can without fighting anyone, and then leave the zone and come back. You will likely get spawned into a new area, which will allow you to do it again. Don't get greedy. Just grab what you can and then leave. You will be surprised how many resources you're able to get by doing this and loading times in this game are super fast, so it's not that annoying to do this. Sneaking up on zombies is a great way to save on resources. Zombies have a 180 degree zone for seeing you when you're sneaking. That in combination with how much they move around, they are much harder to sneak up on than the zombies in games like Last Day on Earth. And some zombies can see much further range than others, i.e. flies and dogs. However, enemies can't see through anything, so as long as you're behind a chain link fence, you're good. In fact, right now I'm working on using things like shopping carts to get through red zones without having to kill that many enemies. Getting good at using these small items for cover are really helpful for getting the main loot chest. For example, if you time his movement just right, you can get this loot chest in the mall without having to kill the mutant that's guarding it. Also, you can use walls to get sneak attacks on enemies that round a corner even if they're looking at you. If you travel too far away from an area where you killed an enemy, he will respawn. And they can also respawn with time 
time, but it takes a lot longer. You can't craft in zones, so make sure to bring one of each tool. I recommend two axes for this green zone. If a resource does not require you to use a tool, then you can gather it while sneaking. You will not be able to gather resources if there is an enemy within this range of that resource. This also prevents you from gathering resources when you are being attacked. You don't get experience from killing enemies, but you do get a small amount of experience from looting their bodies. The same amount of experience that you get for gathering resources. Auto doesn't work at a long range. If you run fast enough away from an enemy, then they will stop chasing you, which makes shoes much more valuable in this game than they are in other mobile survival games. Fighting two enemies at a time will cost you a lot of health, so sometimes it's better to lure one over to you and kill it, and then sneak up on the other one. And lastly, the main loot chests in these zones are the key to getting the best items, like duct tape in the green zones, and the biggest source for research points. You can get everything you need to build a radio tower and join a clan from the green zones. The first thing you need that you can only get in the yellow zone are gears, which allows you to build a sewing machine and most workbenches above. Of that. After that, you won't need to visit a red zone until you need springs, which are required to build the highest tier workbenches. Green zones have one main loot chest, this yellow zone has three, and the red zones have at least three, but I've noticed that the yellow and red zones still only have one of these main loot chests that will give the best items that you are looking for. Perhaps sometime in the future I will make videos pointing out which main loot chests give the best loot. When you master the zones, you will start bringing in tons of resources quickly. So you will want to have a base that is set up to handle the production of all those resources. Generally speaking, when you are building your base, I recommend building the workbenches in the order they have for you. But I will be recommending a few exceptions and you will want to build multiples of some workbenches before advancing to the next workbench. The first example of this this is the seed bed. I recommend building at least two of these and three campfires. Food is really hard to get in this game without doing a lot of research, and research does not come quickly. Having two seed beds and three campfires will allow you to produce potato soup rather quickly, which is the easiest way to get food without doing a lot of research. You also want to build two woodworking benches and two metalworking. One stone cutter's table has been enough for me, but I have also not spent a lot of time upgrading my base since no one can raid it yet. You will notice that many of the options in your workbenches are not available until you research them. You can do that by first finding one of those items in a zone or something, or buying it, and then placing it on the research table with the appropriate amount of research points. Successfully researching an item that you can already build, like wood plank, will unlock new options for production. You will notice that this number is very low. If it fails, then it will permanently increase your chance of successfully researching it at the next time by whatever the base amount is, but you'll have to go find another one of those items. Now you can apply more research points than requested to get a higher chance of researching that item, but I would not recommend doing this unless you are researching a very rare or expensive item. And then if you do it, I would encourage you to make sure it goes all the way up to 100% because if it fails, you still only get the base amount of bonus for your next try. I personally recommend researching the baseball bat first. You can find several of them in the green zones and research them when their durability gets close to zero because there is no penalty for researching almost broken items. The reason I'm recommending a baseball bat is because it's a good enough weapon to use to clear the yellow zone, but it does five times as much overall damage as a knife, and it is still a fairly inexpensive weapon. I also recommend skipping the research of tier 2 armor because it's not that much stronger than tier 1 and because the tier 3 shirt is automatically unlocked for you when you build a sewing machine. Research is a big part of this game. As I mentioned earlier, the best place to get research points are from the main loot chest of each zone, but you can also get a few from normal chests scattered throughout the zones. I would suggest holding off at first on unlocking these extra options for processing materials. The shorter times are actually more efficient, and every time you craft an item you get 30 experience points, which is 10 times as much as gathering an item. Crafting items is the fastest way to level up in this game, so using your workbench every 15 minutes is not only a little bit more efficient, but it gets you a lot more experience. The bed can give you full health every 8 hours, which is a great way to save food. Like I said, food is the hardest thing to get when you're 
you're first starting off. I recommend using your bed as often as possible. When you upgrade your bed, the waiting time will reset, so make sure to upgrade at a time that you need health and it's on cooldown. I would even recommend paying a dollar every once in a while out of the hundred dollars you're given, but don't do this if your food or water count are low because then you can just let yourself die and get all your stuff back. Also, the bed does not reset your food and water count, so if you're starving, the bed doesn't really help. Leveling up does though, so timing when you level up can be a great way to save food. You lose one food and water point every 10 seconds, and if you are at zero at one of them, you lose five health every 10 seconds. So it can be pretty brutal if you run out of food or water. As I mentioned earlier, I recommend building your workbenches in the order they have set for you with three exceptions. First, I have not yet built a well. So far this has only been inconvenient once since I started playing four days ago. I also recommend skipping the plastic recycler and plastic manufacturer. I have been able to get lots of plastic without recycling it, and even though I'm missing out on getting this combat handle, the machete requires research in order to build it, and the combat knife does not, so I'm glad that I skipped over those two and built this one first. Getting the combat knife has allowed me to do red zones with ease. Lastly, if you're storing items, you will notice that most items stack at 10 or 20, but some items stack as low as 5 or even 1 bullets and research credits stack at 100 and dog tags stack at 1000. But you can also stack one item and unlimited research credits in the research table if you're needing extra room. As soon as you get a half of a baseball bat, tier 1 gear, and a decent stack of food, I recommend taking on the green single player boss. Don't bring less than that because remember you cannot leave the zone without getting locked out. The boss drops a full durability weapon ranging from a baseball bat to a combat knife, one or two pieces of tier 2 armor, some dog tags and some health. It is much more than it costs to kill him. There are also eight or nine normal crates that you can loot around the area so it's really helpful to fight the boss as often as you can. So that's all the single player stuff which is fun but there's a lot of fun single player survival games out there. What makes Prey Day stand out from those other survival games is that it actually has multiplayer that is fun. First there are the PvP zones. In my opinion there are only three effective ways to do the PvP zones. The first way is of course to go with your clan. No single person can take on a clan so you can get away with almost anything and you can surround people so they can't run away. But a lot of people want to do PvP before they have a clan. So there are two other effective ways. You can bring good gear with a combat knife or preferably a handmade gun. I wouldn't use anything nicer than that because most people you find aren't going to be that well equipped. I recommend going to the park because it is where the most amount of people show up to farm resources. And then just run up and kill them. Half the time they won't even know what's happening until it's already over. Over. I'm sure the competition will get stronger as more people start playing this game, but right now, it's really easy. Another tactic that I've seen used well is to go with nothing, not even a backpack. That way if you die, you lose nothing. You go find someone and you just start punching them. They're then forced to kill you and waste their weapon or run away. And then I imagine they find a few people with low health and get lucky. Regardless, there's no risk if you don't bring anything. In addition to that, I have nine other tips and tricks for PvP zones. When your health is full, the other players sees an empty bar, which isn't that intimidating. But if you keep your health between 90 to 99, they will see a full red bar and they're more likely to be scared. Staying near the edge makes it hard for someone to kill you. If you're hunting someone else, make sure you first get between them and the edge so they have to run through you or run the longer distance. Make sure to bring decent shoes because it makes a big difference when chasing people. Almost no one brings shoes, so it gives you a huge advantage. The body of the player and the loot on them will stay there until they re-enter the zone. So if you accidentally exit the area, you can come back and loot the body as long as they don't return to that zone. If you kill someone super close to the edge, sometimes it won't let you loot the body because it'll end up triggering the edge of the map. Don't use bullets with handmade guns because the increased damage is based on a percentage, so you want to only use them with the best guns. And lastly, the main loot chests in the PvP zones have usually already been raided, which is super annoying. I don't know if they're on a 45 minute timer like the other yellow zones, but I hope they change this in the future because it really kills the motivation to visit PvP zones for loot. When you're making or joining a clan, there are a few things you need to keep in mind. First, the research symbol here does not seem to line up with actual research, but it is correlated with how active a player is, so make sure to choose active players in your clan. Second, when you're traveling with your clan to a location make sure to arrive at around the same time. Otherwise, you might end up in two different versions of that zone. It seems like there's a limit of around 20 to 30 people per zone. Your clan chat messages are permanent, so feel free to send someone a message on clan chat, even if you know that they're not currently online. 
Once your clan is ready, you can take on the clan boss. He clearly has the best loot in the game, so this should definitely be a goal for your clan. He has 5,000 hit points and no armor, but there are a few other zombies in the area, so make sure to bring enough damage to kill him. Currently, my clan has been saving up our resources, and after we kill him a few times, I'll make a video on how to kill the clan boss for you guys. A few other notes, the game is not currently out on iOS. The game is almost unplayable if you have really bad internet because it won't let you gather resources and the game eats up your phone battery really quick. Well, that's it guys, hope that helps. I know that's a lot of information and some of this information won't really make sense until you've played the game for a while. So I recommend watching this video again after you've played for a while and continuing to do that until you watch it and don't really learn anything. All right guys, I'll see you next time.